Good evening, everyone, and welcome at our webinar about analytical challenges in times of COVID. This webinar is organized uh, in collaboration between the KVCV and Laborama. And on behalf of the KVCV, I will now give you a short introduction about us. So the KVCV are the Royal Flemish Chemical Society. We are uh, the Chemical Society of Flanders, so the Dutch speaking, the northern part of Belgium. And we, are a, we are a community of uh, chemists in Flanders and far beyond because everyone can become a member of our society. And our members are mainly students, PhD students, academics, teachers, and professionals. So we really do represent and strive to support everyone within the chemical education, the industry, and the society. We mainly organize lectures about popular scientific topics for a general audience or more domain specific workshops. And typically after our events, we have also a networking reception, but unfortunately in the online editions, that's not possible. Here you have an overview of our upcoming events. If you want any more information, you can always visit our website, kvcv.be slash calendar and also registrations are possible via this way. Men's and Molecule is our uh, magazine, which is in Dutch and is distributed to all our members each month. So this means we have 12 editions a year. And in this magazine, we can find information about the chemical industry, but also academics, our own activities, scientific advancements, and much more. As a member uh, of UCAM, so U the UCAM is the European Chemical Society, and as a member of KVCV, you're automatically also a member of UCAMS. And as a member of UCAMS, we have uh, discount at various activities endorsed or organized by UCAMS. If you are a member of the KVCV, you have reduced prices at our activities. You receive, as already mentioned, our magazine, Men's and Moleculum, but you're also part of the chemistry community within Flanders, and this helps you to extend your knowledge and broaden your network. For more information about our membership, you can always visit our webpage, kvcv.be slash membership. So let's stay in touch. All information can also be found on our website, kvcv.be. We can also be reached via our social media channels. We have a Facebook uh, account, but we also have a YouTube channel on which you can rewatch all our webinars again. And you can also find us on LinkedIn. As already mentioned, this is a collaboration between KVCV and Laborama. So I will now give the word, the word to um, Alea Vervake, who will give you more information about Laborama. Good evening, everybody. Do you see my screen? Probably not yet. <clears throat> yes, good evening. Uh, Laborama is very pleased about the collaboration we have with uh, KVCV uh, for tonight, but already um, since many, many years uh, working together. Uh, who are we? Well, we are a professional association for distributors and manufacturers of the laboratory equipment of uh, and AXO series in Belgium and Luxembourg. Uh, we are founded in 1936. This uh, looks like a long time, but it shows also the, the legacy uh, that we have with our members. And today uh, we are around um, 90 members in the association. We are... Um, a group like minded uh, people uh, who are uh, in pursuit of serving our clientele in, in the best way possible, but it also the, the enables a cohesion and collegiality around uh, our uh, members. Uh, it means that uh, even if uh, we are uh, positioning different products uh, in the market towards our customers, we also have a platform to uh, talk to each other, to compare, to also um, be able to enable, uh, for instance, new legislation or address new 
a problematic that our customers have uh, together. So we also promote uh, ethical entrepreneurship. We are upholding of quality performance products we bring to the market and we are in respect of uh, safety and respect for the environmental. The Laborama Charter is um, that we are aware of our economic and social role and our members are committed to provide the customers the best services and technical resources so that they can carry out their research and product endeavors with the maximum of production quality, safety and respect for the environment. Uh, our members are active in all industries and all facets where the laboratories are implicated. And here you see a subset of um, the activities of our members. We also have our own activities um, in non-COVID times. Uh, we, we organize uh, a live Laborama trade fair. Uh, this is a yearly event. Um, and hopefully next year we will be able to have a, a, a real event uh, based after COVID times uh, in the uh, <clears throat> Brussels uh, Heisel uh, Fair uh, in June time. Also, we organize yearly uh, lab automation days, a food testing day, and for the different industries, we organize industry days and webinars like these of tonight. If you want to learn more, of course, we have a website and you can also contact us on info at laborama.be or um, we are to, to be found on LinkedIn, Facebook or Twitter with the, the different addresses that you see on the screen here. We hope for sure that you will enjoy uh, the webinar and um, well, uh, we'll give uh, the floor to Tony to introduce you to the the rest of the seminar tonight. Okay, uh, thanks Alain. Um, thanks everybody um, for joining this evening. Um, we can inform you that uh, uh, we are currently more than 320 people uh, who joined in this evening who are interesting to hear something of five experts. And uh, five experts in, um, uh, in the analytical field where in the COVID times, they had to do several things in their lab and uh, in order to improve uh, and find uh, uh, everything back. Um, first speaker uh, of this evening will be Piet Maas. Piet Maas is from the KU Leuven. He's from the Rega Institute. He's assistant uh, professor of the KU Leuven. And uh, his focus is on the research of the ecology of emerging uh, zoonic uh, viruses, both in the natural and dead end host, uh, and on the identification of novel viruses in human, animals, and insects. He's committed to investigate these viruses' clinical relevance, for and genetic susceptibility of their ghost, and to explore and predict mechanisms that determine the capability of these viruses to switch um, hosts, as well to the pathogenic potential of these reservoir-borne viruses. Pete will uh, give this lecture now, and there is a Q&A uh, bottom also on the, uh, in your Zoom session. If you have questions, you can always ask them there. At the end of all speakers, we will uh, group that, and we can uh, then have the possibility to answer some questions. Pete? Okay, thank you, Tony, for the nice introduction. So, uh, first of all, thank you that I have the chance uh, to, uh, to show some of our results and the methods uh, that we use to come to these results. So, I would like to present our results of our SARS-CoV-2 sequencing that we have done over the past year, and we use uh, Oxford Nanopore Technologies uh, Mi9 sequencing for this. So let me see. So to start, um, I think that everybody agrees that I can say that Illumina sequencing is the gold standard for next generation sequencing or the new sequencing facilities. So Oxford Nanopore Technologies came up 
uh, a few years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago, with a new technique based on nanopore sequencing. Of course, uh, Minayan or nanopore sequencing is comparable with Illumina sequencing, but there are still some differences. So if you com compare Illumina sequencing with nanopore sequencing, there are some advantages and some negative points to use both techniques or to use one of the both techniques. So for Illumina sequencing, the most positive uh, point is uh, that it's a very high throughput, which makes that uh, the, the sequencing cost per base is very low. Of course, it depends on which type of uh, platform or machine that you use, sorry. So Illumina sequencing is very good for virus discovery because you can go very deep in your sequencing. A negative point here for Illumina sequencing is, is that the fragments that you sequence, that they are relatively short, eh, around 150 base pairs. So that makes it actually you can only have a sort of consensus sequence. So if you really want to look at single cell, uh, single strains of, for example, a virus, it's already uh, it's difficult or almost impossible to use Illumina sequencing for that. So for nanopore sequencing, uh, the, the most positive point here is that you can do long fragment sequencing. There is actually no limit on the, the, the length of your fragment. I think that the, the current record is on uh, over 2 million base pairs at once. In our lab, it's around 750,000 base pairs that we can sequence in one go or one segment. So that makes that it's quite easy in uh, this regard to, to to look at uh, interspecies or to look at variability of one specific strain in one cell or for a virus to uh, define the whole uh, specific, specific uh, variance in, 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 uh, for a virus in a host, for example. Another advantage is that you can do direct RNA sequencing, so you don't need to convert your samples first, first to cDNA or to DNA fragments. And you can have real-time results. So when you start your sequencing, you can immediately see what you've sequenced and you can immediately start the analysis, which, which is something that for the Illumina sequencing, it's until now uh, still difficult. The major disadvantage, however, is the higher uh, cost per base. Uh, you cannot go uh, sequence that much as like uh, the bigger Illumina machines. So that means that you have a higher cost per base pair. And another problem, although uh, it's getting a lot better, is a relatively better uh, error rate here. So that means that if you want to have the same sequence as for Illumina, you need to sequence uh, much deeper or a lot more to have the same high quality and um, consensus sequence. Okay, so in, in terms, I immediately wanted to go uh, with the first example of a benefit of Minayan sequencing. So if I talk about real-time results, so this is an example of here in Belgium, remember February last year, when Corona or the COVID started to become a problem in Europe. Uh, the 2nd of February, for example, we had our first positive case in Belgium. Um, Philippe Sugri, uh, who came back from a repatriated flight from Wuhan. Uh, he was the only one actually on the flight who was positive for uh, the coronavirus. So to give an example of the timeline, when we received the sample in the lab, yeah, we first did the qPCR to uh, do a first initial test if the sample or the patient was positive. Uh, afterwards, when it was positive uh, on qPCR, we always use uh, three defined targets. Uh, it was found positive, but because it was our first samples, we did not really have good positive controls. We had to uh, confirm this by sequencing, for which we used Minayan uh, sequencing with a rapid kit. So and if you look at the timeline, so from the moment the sample came in into our lab until we had the final result with the sequence, the consensus sequence with Mi9, it took us around eight, eight and a half hours. So actually it's only the preparation uh, part making uh, the RNA extraction, uh, the amplification protocol, the library prep took most of the time and the Mi9 sequences itself took less than a minute to have a good confirmed uh, and well-supported consensus sequence uh, to confirm our result. 
So what is uh, the technology behind uh, nanopore sequencing? So it's actually uh, a protein pore uh, fixed on a synthetic membrane. And if you would put current uh, among it, so, so one side to the other, there will be an um, ionic current through the pore. So if you would now push proteins or other uh, chemical compounds through it, and you measure the, the ionic, ionic current, it will of course be disturbed uh, depending on what you put through the nanopore. So actually this is the principle that's used uh, for the sequencing that uh, with, with some uh, tracer enzymes, you put uh, fragments that you want to sequence on the nanopore and you pull it through. And if you measure the changes in the current, uh, it will be very characteristic for each base pair and that way you can estimate or you can calculate what your uh, bases were eh, of what your sequence is that's been put through the nanopore. Of course, this is very basic uh, in terms of uh, technique. So if there are more questions about this, you can always, uh, so I can come back to that during the Q&A if you want more details on this aspect. So the nice thing here with the uh, nanopore sequencing is that it's very small. So um, it, it's, it's a, a device that you can hold in your hand. So this in comparison to uh, the Immuni Illumina um, machines, this is really handy. And the big advantage here is that you can also use this in the field. And like I show here, we actually uh, use this. Uh, we used this before for other outbreaks, for example, Ebola virus uh, sequencing to trace the epidemic. We used that in Guinea and for example, in DRC on several uh, outbreaks during the last years. Sorry, I was just, I forgot to put my laptop in, uh, in the current, sorry about that. So now uh, about uh, the corona sequencing. I think it's a question that everybody has. Every virus mutates. So and what is, uh, does it really matter that we constantly sequence uh, the SARS coronavirus? So internationally until now, uh, since February last year, 2020, over a million 200,000 sequences of this virus have been generated, which, which is really an amazing effort. Um, but is it really worth doing this? So interestingly, coronavirus are actually relatively slow uh, evolving of mutating viruses. If we would compare it to a virus like, for example, influenza, uh, that mutates like 10 times faster than coronavirus. So the evolutionary rate is more or less uh, one to the 10 minus three substitutions per site per year. Uh, this is a scientific um, definition, but that it's more or less two substitutions or two nucleotide changes in the whole genome each month. Of course, this is for a single strain. Uh, the more people that are infected, uh, the more changes can be uh, can be seen and the more changes or mutations you will see. So this is actually what's happening now. Uh, in the beginning, it appeared that the coronavirus a year ago uh, evolved a lot slower, but that was simply because less people were infected. We are now at a stage where it's really a pandemic. Uh, the infection rate is almost a thousand times higher than a year ago. So that means that we have a huge population that is infected and carrying the coronavirus and each of the individuals are uh, making or generating new viruses between brackets that have a slightly different genome and can hold several new or unique mutations. <clears throat> so a bit about uh, the way we uh, do the sequencing of the coronavirus. So the thing is here that um, although uh, you can use both Illumina or Mi9 to do the sequencing, but we needed to take a look at it, not only we or internationally, uh, we had to make some choices to reduce the cost. So the best way of sequencing the coronaviruses unbiased would be to use a metagenomic approach so that you would sequence uh, the sample without amplification and just look at the complete variability. 
the negative points here is that it's quite slow and very expensive. So here we needed to make a choice that we first do a sort of amplification. There are several protocols available. We decided, and most labs in Belgium actually do, uh, to follow the Arctic uh, network protocols. So here they divided the genome of around 30,000 bases in several small fragments of around 400 uh, bases each. So each part here is uh, separately amplified in a PCR. It's actually a PCR with two big pools of uh, over 100 primers. And after this amplification, um, you do the library prep, you put it on a, on a Minayan machine, and then afterwards you can map or uh, regenerate uh, your, your, your sequence with reference mapping and you have your sequence. So this is actually quite fast. Um, on a typical Minayan run, you can put 96 samples at once and the procedure will take you around in total with the, the run itself. It can go from eight hours to 24 hours uh, before you get a very good uh, result. This will, of course, depend on the concentration or the viral load of the sample and uh, the quality of the RNA extract and so on. But it's actually a quite robust and um, fast way. The nice thing about, for example, this Arctic protocol uh, is that a lot of uh, scientists worldwide are using it. So it's very well tested and every mistake of if there is a, something popping up uh, that can be of a concern in the protocol, it's uh, the scientific community can change it quite fast here. Okay, if you look at the variability, so this is a plot uh, that I made uh, earlier on today that shows all the variation that have been detected so far. And the conclusion here is that actually every or almost every site uh, in the genome had already a, a change, but this is based on uh, a little bit over 1 million sequences. Of course, you see at uh, the longer the peak, the more changes are detected. And you see, especially in the, in the spike, that there, that there is a, a higher accumulation of more uh, mutations that uh, seem to reoccur, reoccur, which is, of course, uh, quite normal. Okay, I would like to uh, define some uh, definitions first. Uh, you probably all heard of a variant of interest of a variant of concern. Uh, there is, of course, uh, a difference. So uh, the variant that's now a lot in the news uh, is, is the relatively new Indian variant, which is causing a lot of problems uh, in India, and for example, lately also in the UK. But until now, that's still a variant of interest. And then you have a variant of concern, which is, for example, the British or the UK variant. We also have the South African variant and the Brazilian variant. So there is, of course, a difference between uh, the two. And the WHO, end of February, they made a very good, uh, precise definition of it, of it. Another thing, but I come back to that right away. Another uh, definition uh, or subject I want to touch is, of course, that there is a difference between a variant and a mutation. Uh, it makes all sense if I say it, but, but a lot of people seem to, to mix the two. So a variant is actually um, a set of specific mutations that give a virus a certain advantage or a certain evolutionary uh, characteristic. Of course, a mutation is a single mutation, a single change in, uh, an, uh, in the genome. Of course, both can be important. A single mutation can give a benefit to a virus but most of the time a variant that's beneficial or has a uh, as an advantage consists uh, of, of several mutations. But one example I would, to, would like to give uh, is a spike mutation. It's actually the first spike mutation that has been seen uh, already last year. It's the D614-2G spike mutation. And it's a mutation that apparently gives um, the, the virus a benefit in a nicer fit to the ACE2 receptor in humans um, and, and, and a higher infective, infectivity. If we look at uh, the form of the spike, it's actually a confirmation of three different uh, subunits of the spike that render together. And you have a closed 
confirmation and an open confirmation. The open confirmation is a confirmation that can easily be bind to the ACE2. And if you have that uh, 614 2G mutation, apparently the, the, the protein would always be uh, presented in an open confirmation. So it will more easily bind to the receptor cells or to the host cells. And that's something that we've seen uh, in Belgium as well. Uh, uh, Subri, our first patient, he had the wild type, uh, so the D614. And very early on, we noticed that this spike mutation appeared. And along the way, it, it really took over the complete set of variants, not only in Belgium, but internationally. And since uh, June, July, almost 100% of all sequences that we detected and also international were always of uh, with this uh, 614 gene mutation. So now to come back to the variant of interest and the variant of concern. So what is a variant of interest? is of course a set of mutations of a variant that make uh, that, that give an advantage to the virus uh, phenotypically uh, compared to the to the the, the wild type reference uh, the first Wuhan uh, sequence that was um, detected and of course it needs to be more it needs to be established uh, it's not only once a sequence with that specific mutations occurs but it needs to be consistent over time and if possible, also or uh, geographically spread in several areas. If it's a variant of concern, it's of course, um, every variant of concern is a variant of interest, but it adds to it that it uh, has an inc increase in infectivity, in transmissibility of an other uh, detrimental effect of the mutations, which makes it much more uh, dangerous uh, to us, uh, the patients. And just to, to say uh, the difference between a variant of concern of interest, until now, internationally, there are three variants of concern described. You all know it, uh, the, the UK variant, the South African variant, and the Brazilian variant. And for the variants of interest, there are really a lot. Um, I just give a few here. So there are a lot of specific mutations and variants that we need to watch out for. So now uh, I think I need to speed up a bit. So um, there are a lot of different names for uh, naming variants. Uh, the one which is mostly used is the ones that uh, use the Bs in the name. So uh, here, for example, uh, the, the UK variant is the B11.7. Uh, the Brazilian variant is the P1. And it's actually named by uh, uh, an algorithm which is called Pangolin which uses phy phylogeny clustering of your sequences to name the virus. Uh, the clusters only get names if there is a very clear uh, phylogenetic cluster of your sequences separate for the rest, and that it's associated with some um, epidemiological or geographic uh, spread, and that you should really see a trend in those sequences. We always try to have the latest sequences, so we're not going back to sequences from a year ago to define a clade because that actually doesn't make any sense anymore. And based on those and based on the clustering, uh, you, 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 make, uh, you number your sequences uh, or your clusters. And now we are really already at a few thousand different strains that have some specific epidemiological or geographical spread or characteristics. Um, all right, I already mentioned this. Uh, so if we look at the spread, um, this is a, a, a figure from, uh, let me see, this is a, a number from the end of March, oh, sorry, where you see some uh, changes. So this is internationally the most uh, prevalent variants of the viruses. You see that in the beginning, and you had only a few, and then slowly it gets uh, changed by new variants, and then over time it changes. And then here we are at the end. You see now uh, that especially the UK variant and a bit the South African and Brazilian variant are coming up. And even now, uh, the situation as of today, it's still uh, clear that the UK variant, the B117, 
uh, is the most prevalent. If we look at Belgium, for example, we are almost at 90%. We're actually seeing only four variants, the three VOCs, the Vox, uh, UK, Brazilian and South African, and the fourth one, which we until now call the Belgian variant, which, which is always present in a few percentages. So this is just an example of the three um, uh, VOCs, uh, just to, to show you that each of them has a specific set of mutations and or deletions that, that gives the uh, advantage to the virus in terms of infectivity and possible also in, in, uh, in disease. So that especially for the UK variant that uh, uh, there is a link to more severe disease. It's important to say here that for the UK variant, there is a, a higher chance with the UK variant to, uh, to be hospitalized, but there, there seems to be no difference between a higher mortality. So it's a higher disease, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a uh, uh, higher mortality. So you see for each of the three variants that there is a difference in uh, specific, that they all have a specific set of mutations. So to conclude my talk here, um, I just, uh, I forgot about the number, luckily I put it here. Eh? We have uh, 1,283,000 sequences internationally, uh, full length sequences. Most of them, uh, I think 85% are sequenced with me nine. Uh, technology. And for Belgium, we're almost at 17,000, thanks to a very nice consortium of 18 labs, uh, consisting of labs from the clinic and university labs. So we have three variants of concern. Each of them have their specific mutations. And this is one I already mentioned, uh, apart from the Indian variant. Uh, we, we have a specific variant uh, in Belgium that we see a lot, almost in 5% of the cases already from January this year. Uh, there is a link with uh, Congo, Brazzaville, and uh, the, from the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Republic of Congo, which also has a specific set of mutations. And interestingly here, there is also a uh, very specific deletion and an insertion. So there are three amino acids added to the spike, which disrupt a bit the coding and uh, hides some sp uh, specific immunogenic, immunogenic uh, regions for the uh, immune system. But more importantly, uh, everybody always talks about spike. Of course, what about the mutations in other genes? So we see a lot of mutations in the polymerase of the virus. Uh, we have no idea what impact these, these mutations have for the survival or fitness of the virus. And of course, what about deletions and insertions? Until now, now that most bioinformatic or analytic pipelines, they don't consider insertions and deletions. So it's possible that uh, during the course of this whole year, we probably missed already a lot of these because we simply don't uh, look at that. And so with this, I would like uh, to stop my presentation. If there are any questions, uh, I am happy to hear them at the end of, uh, of the session. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Pete, for the, the talk. Um, our next speaker um, is uh, Peter uh, Peumans. Uh, Peter uh, Peumans, uh, working at uh, IMEC. He holds a PhD in electrical engineering from Princeton University and uh, master degrees at the University of Leuven also. Prior to joining EMEC 10 years ago, uh, uh, Peter uh, Peumans was professor electrical engineering at Stanford also. And currently he is leading the EMEC Health Technology Program. Peter, the floor is yours. Yeah. <clears throat> thanks, Tony. And thanks to all of the attendees for spending their evening uh, with us. So I'll talk about um, COVID testing. Uh, <clears throat> clearly in a pandemic, the ability, it's, it's really important that you're able to detect <clears throat> individuals who are um, spreading the infection. And so we've been working on a potentially a better way to do so. So maybe to start off, this is, of course, you all know this, this kind of a picture. This is how a lot of uh, COVID-19 testing uh, is done today via nasopharyngal swab. Uh, 
more recently also via an anterior nasal swab or saliva or a throat swab. There's many ways to swab. But in any case, swabbing is, is not, it's not perfect eh? so for many reasons. One is that uh, the, the degree to which the swab represents the is it, or yields a representative sample depends on the skill of the of the person performing the swabbing. So especially especially when we want to move to self testing to to reduce the load on healthcare personnel, that becomes a significant uh, problem. There's a discomfort too. There's logistics which are which are an issue, and so some of these issues are shown here too. And so <clears throat> so if we're let well, me to, to backtrack. So in case of COVID. What we've all seen is that one of the, ma the major challenges is that, of course, you're infectious before you have symptoms. That's, that's one aspect. And two is that uh, the, the dynamics of the viral load, and hence presumably also the dynamics of how infectious you are, is very rapid in the initial phase of the disease. So on the, on the graph on the left-hand side, it's really that initial phase, you see a very quick rise in the viral load. And so ideally, if you've been in contact with someone, you want to be able to measure frequently to be able to see if you're going to be infectious. Um, and because you don't have symptoms yet, and because you need to measure frequently, it's really important that we have a way to, um, to, the, to, to screen uh, people for COVID-19 that is not invasive, that is easy to do, that is cheap, uh, and so on. Um, I mentioned that Sampling today with nasopharyngeal swab or any other type of swab typically requires a skilled worker to do it well. And so that's the picture you see on the top, top right. And uh, if you look at a lot of the longitudinal data that's out there, you tend to see a lot of variability. So the, the, the CT curves for a PCR performed on these swab samples tends to be all over the place. The curve you see here is for throat samples, but you tend to see similar things for other types of, uh, of swabs. So it, it appears to be a sample that's relatively hard to, uh, to standardize. Now, COVID-19, of course, we've known for a while now that the way the virus transmits uh, most frequently is via exhaled breath, and, so, and more specifically, via small particles that you exhale. And so we typically, these particles are categorized as either uh, aerosols when they're smaller than five micron diameter or droplets when they're bigger. And the difference is in how long they stay aloft uh, with the bigger particles tending to settle uh, relatively quickly which gave us the 1.5 meter uh, distance rule, whereas the aerosols tend to stay aloft for longer periods of time. Um, the consensus appears to be uh, in the literature that if you're, uh, in, if you're infectious, you're going to emit between a few to few thousand virions per minute. Um, and that's of course how we transmit the disease. So the, the graphic on the, on the right hand side is, is from, a, from a Spanish newspaper, newspaper, El País, where you, you see how a patient zero here, the index case in a restaurant setting infected nine other individuals uh, because, the, uh, because there is a, uh, an air conditioning unit which circulates the air exhaled by patient zero and uh, additional um, people in the room can then inhale those particles and that way get, get infected. The typical dose for infection, again, appears to be from the literature about 100 to 1,000 virions. And if, if you take into account typical ventilation um, uh, performance in these types of rooms, that is co actually consistent with the emission of, a, of an infected uh, person. Now, so it seems evident that if this is how the virus transmits, then you would actually try and sample breath because it's potentially a very easy sample to give. It's essentially exhaling into a device. And it's also a direct measurement of how contagious you are. However, uh, sampling aerosols hasn't been easy. Uh, this is a setup uh, from the University of Maryland uh, by, uh, from the lab of Don Milton, who's been really at the forefront of this. And so this type of sampling requires that you sit in a tent, as you see here, for 30 minutes to one hour while breathing into a funnel. So it, that's a far, a long distance away from a practical uh, screening test that you might perform prior to boarding, for example, an airplane or prior to, prior to uh, eating at a restaurant. So we, need to, we needed to improve on this. Says, so that's what we've been working on. So we've been working on a, you call it a cigar shaped uh, breath collector uh, or breathalyzer um, that you breathe into for about a minute. Uh, and, when, and when you do so, the, uh, the collector will collect these small particles very efficiently and will also allow you to do a molecular analysis on those particles. So very important is that this is not a test based on VOCs, so volatile organic compounds, as and we've all seen many of those uh, in the press 
the past couple of months. We, our, our opinion about VOCs is that it's, we, it, we've got a hard time imagining how VOCs can give you a, a very sensitive and specific result for COVID-19 because it essentially it's part of the host response. We've, we've in contrast focused on detecting the virus directly in these exhaled uh, liquid particles via RT to PCR. Um, today we're very focused on COVID, uh, of course, uh, but we think this approach is going to be useful, for example, for influenza, um, for uh, for RSV, for uh, for TB, and for many other respiratory infections. And of course, we're also thinking about making sure we're ready for the next pandemic, making sure we can catch viruses that are uh, transmitted pre-symptomatically. Um, now, the way it works actually is that uh, inside the disposable, the sample collector, there is a chip and it's somewhat of a unique chip because it's a, it's a chip you can breathe through. Huh? So it's a chip with many holes uh, perforated through it. The holes are, are quite small. They're, they're tens of microns diameter and there's a very large number of them to make sure the resistance to airflow is low enough so that uh, you know, any, any person can relatively easily breathe through these devices. And the key is that the holes in the top substrate and the bottom substrate are misaligned, as you can see in the, the, the more detailed inset. And this forces the air you push through to take a sudden, a very sudden curve a, a, or a turn. And the small particles can't follow that turn. Uh, and they essentially is precipitated out by a process called, called uh, impaction. And so you end up with um, essentially vital particles uh, in, in a wet state sitting on the surface inside the chip. One of the key aspects uh, of the design of the chip is that the volume we're collecting these particles in is really quite small. It's a couple of cubic millimeters, such that we can perform uh, a, a sensitive and very fast downstream analysis, in this case, RT qPCR. Um, after collection of the sample, the idea is that you dock the collector into an instrument. Uh, so the sampling takes a minute, you dock into the instrument, after which the analysis can be performed as quickly as in five minutes using a, a very fast uh, RT-QPCR protocol. And then the results are made available to, to a platform of, um, of choice. Um, so, so I explained a bit about how this works uh, already. Um, you might think, well, but if I wear a face mask, I, I, I have in effect do the same thing. I collect these small, these small particles. So why don't I use a face mask? and then stick it into a, into a PCR machine. Well, of course, the trouble with a face mask is that you're collecting virus over a relatively large volume. And so washing the virus off efficiently in a small volume, so you can do a sensitive and um, RTQPCR is very challenging. And we, do, we don't think anyone's really solved that problem. So for us, the collection of the particles into a small volume is really, really one of the key steps. And so on the right-hand side here, you see what happens uh, after the virus is collected. Uh, so the, the aqueous particles are collected on the surface by impaction. We will then add uh, once a single reagent mix that performs the next three steps. Uh, the first one being the, um, the lysis using a detergent. Step number two, of course, the RT step going from uh, RNA to DNA. And then finally, the PCR, where we're using a very traditional uh, uh, PCR process using thermal cycling and molecular uh, probes. The difference being that because the PCR is performed on a small sample in a very in a thermally very conductive container, i.e. silicon, that PCR process can be performed relatively quickly uh, down to down to five minutes. So, you, so here you see some of the, the reasons why the use of silicon here was key for us so on, the, on the left hand side. Uh, the design of these impactors, huh? so the, the design of a geometry you can breathe through without much resistance that still allows you to collect particles efficiently, even particles down to a few hundred nanometers uh, in diameter. And then two on the right-hand side is the ability to thermally cycle the silicon containers very quickly. So we can do the RT and the PCR actually, in this case, uh, I believe a 46 cycle PCR, uh, all in, uh, in about five minutes, which you know, if, you're, if you're about to board an airplane and you wanna check if your breath contains a, um, uh, a level of COVID-19, then the, the, the five minutes really is a, is a nice feature to have. So you don't have to wait for, for hours before you have your, your test result. Um, this is what it looks like today. Uh, so what you see here is Joren, who is a student who is working on actually our clinical evaluations of this. Uh, it's still a prototype, 
but I'll show you some of the product versions later on. Uh, what you see here is, uh, is Jorim breathing into a disposable mouthpiece, uh, followed by a rectangular um, a container, if you like, which houses the chip. And then finally, a filter at the end, which is a standard commercial filter to make sure that uh, if we miss a virus with the chip, that that virus isn't uh, blown into the, uh, into the surrounding space. So we've done a number of uh, clinical studies. Um, this, uh, so I'll report on, th on three of those. This was our first a very small study we did in the low care COVID ward at uh, KU Leuven, UZ Leuven. Um, and so what you see here, um, so this is a, a graph showing CT of a uh, recorded with a nasopharyngeal swap on the, on the horizontal axis, and then CT recorded via our aerosol test uh, on the vertical axis. And so you tend to see, first of all, a, a correlation. And so that's right here, the CT values correlate. We tend to see a higher CT for the aerosol sample. Not surprising because the volume we're in fact collecting is really quite small. We're talking about nanoliters as opposed to microliters of fluid. And so we're collecting only a tiny amount of fluid. And that's why the CT tends to be uh, higher for the, for the breath sample. That's what you see here. But you tend to see a correlation between CT values. Uh, we also see some folks who are positive on NP swap, but negative on, uh, on aerosol. And so we're not quite sure yet whether this is due to a lack of sensitivity, or this is because these folks are still ha harboring virus, or at least still have RNA in their bodies, but are no, no longer infectious. We also see the, the opposite. We see folks here who've got a very high CT on the nasopharyngeal swab. So those two individuals here would in fact typically be labeled negative because their CT is over 35. So they've got a low viral load. Yet they've got a, actually quite, a, high, a, quite a, a low CT or a relatively high viral load on the aerosol sample. So we think these might be the so-called super spreaders that tend to, to, to spread a disproportionate amount uh, of, the, uh, of the virus. But again, this was just the first uh, study just to confirm that this idea that you would actually breathe into something and you would then detect virus in the aerosol, that that, that actually makes, makes sense. We then performed a, a second study uh, in the test street, the K11 test street. So those were students who had exposure or with symptoms who could come in uh, to get screened for COVID-19. And so here we're comparing our, again, our test to a nasopharyngeal swab plus, uh, plus PCR. And so here we saw um, 39 folks positive on a classical uh, NP swab, uh, of which we detected 33, and six were negative. So this gives you an, uh, a percentage positive agreement of 85%, and for the negatives, we had 100% uh, agreement. So we're, not, so we're, we're detecting a lot of the positives, but not quite, not quite all of them. Uh, and so we're still trying to figure out why exactly is, it, is this the case? And can we prove that the, that the individuals who show up negative on the aerosol test can we demonstrate somehow that these folks are not, uh, not contagious? Um, some of that insight will come from our third study, which is actually ongoing, but I'll give you a sneak peek uh, at the data. So here we're showing uh, measurements every day or sometimes even twice a day. Uh, we're comparing four types of tests here. Uh, so we're comparing the nasopharyngeal swab uh, with PCR. That's the dark blue. Apologize for the colors because they look, they look quite similar. We're also doing saliva, uh, spitting into a tube followed by PCR. We're then doing breath, so aerosol followed by PCR. And we're also doing rapid antigen testing. Those are the, the dots here empty meaning negative and full meaning positive. So four, four, uh, four tests. So in this test subject, and this is what we're seeing quite often actually, we're seeing that um, the aerosol sample is the first one that becomes positive right here. So on day one, uh, all the tests, antigen right here, uh, NP swap plus PCR, saliva plus PCR, also negative, but the aerosol sample is the first one to become positive. On day two, all tests become positive as you see here. Um, Interestingly, the CT of uh, saliva and CT of the aerosol test is quite similar. That's something we see quite often. And the CT of the nasopharyngeal swab being a little bit lower, indicating a higher viral load from this sample in the, in the nasopharynx. Then you see the CT decrease over time for the nasopharyngeal sample seen quite often, and then, with a, then a slow decrease afterwards. What we also invariably see is that for the aerosol sample after the first um, the first day positive, we tend to see a gradual decline in the viral load. 
And so we're still trying to understand what the differences are. Uh, it, what's going to happen here is that the aerosol sample will turn negative first before all the other tests. And we're, we're trying to figure out whether that is an, an, a good way to indicate that somebody is safe again to participate in, in normal life because they're no longer emitting a, 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 a sizable amount of the virus and hence can no longer infect uh, other individuals. But we're primarily excited here by the, the prospect of actually having a test that is potentially a lot easier to perform and at the same time actually may give you a time advantage because it can detect the virus earlier. The, some of the physiology that we think might be going on is that when you're doing swap-based sampling, uh, you, you, um, especially early on, you, need, you, you might need to hit the right patch of tissue to, to get the sample. Whereas with aerosol, you tend to sample from a larger volume of the lungs and the uh, respiratory tract, both lower and upper. And so it might be a more representative, more uniform sample. And hence, initially, it might increase your chances of detecting a, a positive. But again, this is all speculation. We don't know, but we're seeing, uh, we're seeing good results uh, so far. Um, so then just a sneak peek at what it will look like in the future. So everything you've seen up to now is with that prototype that we built together with, with Comate. Uh, so a, a living based firm. Uh, we're now working on a more mature version, uh, which is what you see here, uh, early renders of what this might, might look like. So we can actually um, make this user friendly. We can make this manufacturable uh, at, a, at a reasonable cost. So we can start rolling this out in larger quantities, of course, after the required uh, regulatory approval. So we're, we're talking to partners to see who is going to commercialize this test and then, and then roll it out in, uh, in volumes. So in summary, um, you know, we see a few, um, you, you know, you, I would say unique selling points, a few, a few advantages of, uh, of this, this way of testing and we're, we're hoping it's gonna stick around because we think the breath or, or the aerosol sample has been an underappreciated sample because it's been so hard to collect and, and we hope we've changed that. Um, and so, so the ability of to sample breath uh, or aerosols and droplets uh, is yeah, it's low friction. It's really easy. You could imagine doing this type of testing multiple times a day because it just takes a minute. It's not invasive. You know, before you enter the workplace, before you enter the restaurant, before you board a plane, it's it's all conceivable, as as long as you make it cheap enough, of course. Uh, we think it's really important that we're not measuring how much virus you harbor. That actually is to some extent irrelevant in a pandemic, what you really want to know is how much, uh, how much virus is a person emitting and what is the likelihood that that person will infect somebody else. Uh, also very important, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but a breath sample is relatively easy to standardize because you can measure the amount of the, the volume of air delivered, you can quantify the aerosol. So it's a, it's a, it's a type of sample that's easy to QC to, to reduce the, uh, the false negative rate. So we think we're hoping at least, and we're getting ready for that, that there's potential even beyond COVID and also for pandemics, but also for, uh, for diseases that have been around for a long time, like, like tuberculosis to really change the way we diagnose these diseases. Um, a second important uh, aspect of what I presented, we believe is the ability to do ultra fast PCR. Uh, so the time to result uh, can be as low as five minutes. It doesn't need to be, but it could be reduced to as much as, as little as five minutes which in many contexts might be quite valuable. And again, the, the airport setting or public transport is an obvious one. Uh, festivals uh, and any place where a lot of people get together, there may be a good reason to do very fast point of care uh, testing. And then the last point is, uh, because sample collection and uh, sample detection actually is done in the same cavity. I didn't stress this a whole lot, but the, the silicon chip that I talked about earlier is both the collector and the PCR cavity which uh, means that the sample does need to be moved around. It's not a swap where you have to wash off the sample. It's all done in the same place, again, limiting the, the pre-analytical uh, signal loss. So that's a, a third reason we're excited about these, uh, these technologies. So with this, I'll conclude. Thanks, thanks very much, and I'll stick around for the, the Q&A. OK. Um, thanks a lot, Peter, for the, this talk. Next speaker is uh, Ronald uh, Bailly. Ronald is, uh, holds a master degree in biotechnology with specialization in industrial toxicology of the KU Leuven. In his career, he has held various application and support functions, mainly in the clinical diagnostic sector. Today, uh, Ronald is product manager for immunochemistry range within the clinical diagnostic department of Analyse. 
Uh, Ronald, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good evening to all. It's a pleasure for me to, to be with you tonight. First of all, I apologize for my beautiful of horrible French accent. So the subject of this evening is the future challenge in COVID-19 screening to maintain economic activity. Coronavirus are a large family, common found in humans and animals. It's not the first time we have been confronted with uh, the coronavirus family. The first epidemic took place in 2002 in China. It's the SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. After in 2012, uh, we have the, the MERS, uh, the Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome virus. And currently we are faced to the SARS-CoV-2 who is responsible for the COVID-19. The natural host is a bat and the vector of transmission to human is took to, to be the pangolin. And the first contamination in Wuhan come from uh, the food and the wet market. The transmission of the virus involving a combination of both respiratory and fecal route. So you have the, the big droplet nuclei. They don't travel uh, in a very long way, but you have the aerosolized viral particle smaller than five micrometers, and they travel a long distance. So you see in the droplet, you have the, the virus. You can, the transmission is also by direct contact and indirect contact with uh, the surface. So understanding the structure of the virus, it's important for the development of the, and, in vitro di diagnostic tests like the vi viral RNA, antigen, and antibody. The virus is called corona. In Latin, corona for crown because you can see uh, a lot of spicule on the surface on the virus. The virus has four major proteins, the spike, the envelope, the membrane, and the nucleocapsid. The spike protein play an important role in the virus entry mechanism. At the level of the S protein, you can find the receptor binding domain and the RBD binds to the angiotensin covertase enzyme receptor two. It's a protein that we can find in the, in the cell of the heart, kidney, lung and intestine. You have the M protein, the E protein. You have also the viral envelope and inside the capsid and the N protein and the single strain of RNA. What are the, the pathway of entry for, for the virus? You see that it's the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, the nasopharynx and the eyes. So the virus uh, reach the lungs and inside the lungs, the S protein of the virus and the receptor binding domain bind to the angiotensin convert time enzyme. You can see that the, the affinity for the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor is 20 fold more than the first uh, SART it can explain the wide spreading of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The mechanism of entry, you have a, a direct cell entry and uh, endocytosis. Then inside the host cell, you have a multiplication on the virus. And in more severe case, the release of cytokine like TNF-alpha interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 can cause a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So you can have a destruction of the, the tissue. And you see that interleukin-6, interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha 
can lead to a, a severe sepsis and also a septic shock. In the hospital, there are a lot of study with the interleukin-6 because interleukin-6 is uh, well correlated with the severity of the disease. And in some uh, research in the hospital, it can allow the clinician to make a triage for the, the people who, who must go under mechanical ventilation. So patients are affected by an acute respiratory syndrome disease, and it can lead to a severe sepsis, septic shock with a fatal issue. So we need reliable, routine, and widely available testing to find and isolate infected individuals. So we must test, trace, isolate, and of course, vaccinate. The testing challenge for today, the demand exceeds the availability. A long turnaround time can compromise effective patient management, strain on resource, the logistic and the data management, and of course, the diagnostic accuracy. In the population, another difficulty is that we have two categories of people, the symptomatic people and the asymptomatic people. When you look in this study, all the sample are RT-PCR positive. And you see the, the CT value here. So the, the CT is defined as the number of cycles required for the fluorescent signal to, to crush the, the treasure. And you see that the sample, the bullet in, uh, in red are from asymptomatic subject. And you see that for some, the viral load is, uh, is very high. So it's important to, to screen and to, to detect this kind of, uh, of patient. The laboratory method follow two, two pathways from PCR to antigen to, to antibody. For the diagnosis, uh, we work with uh, in PCR with, um, with molecular, with the viral RNA. For the antigen, the viral protein, you can detect with rapid tests of immunoassay analyzer. And it's also important to have an assessment of the immune response. And uh, we measure the antibody tests, the IgG mainly and uh, IgM. It's the same, it's a rapid test of immunoassay method. So you see here below that after the exposure, you, you have a viral rep replication. And first of all, you can use uh, the PCR after the antigen test. And between one of two weeks, we can measure the IgG and IgM, the antibody detection. So to summarize, we have three kinds of tests, the molecular, the antigen, and the antibody. There is a place for each of these tests depending on, on the situation. On this slide, you can see a timeline that summarizes the situation that the laboratory and the in vitro diagnostic company have experienced since March 2019. You see that initially they are just the, the PCR, but there is a saturation of laboratory capacity. Also in the beginning, a lack of region, a lack of instrument. Just after that, in between March to June, you have the rapid antibody testing. But we know that in the beginning, uh, the people who have the antibody are less than five or six percent. And after the antibody testing uh, arrive on the immunoassay analyzer, between uh, June to September, a lot of lab measure the antibody testing. Of course, they do the PCR. For the antibodies, they measure the total antibody of the IgG of IgM. 
after that, in the, in the end of September, beginning of October, you have the, the rapid uh, antigen uh, testing. But in the beginning, hospital laboratory were not really interesting because they have the PCR. But at the beginning of the second wave, the PCR capability were exceed and the lab validate them and use them to, to screen the patient. It should be noted that during the second wave, more in the region of Liège, for example, more than 30% of the patient at the, at the emergency department were positive. And this make it possible to relieve the PCR. Only the negative results were redone in PCR. Currently, the diagnostic company are developing a chemiluminescence antigen test on immunoanalyzer. And of course, you have a better limit of detection. This could be uh, another solution for the, the mass screening. And the assessment of the immune response with the vaccine is very important. If we look at the, the PCR, they use polymerase chain reaction to amplify, to amplify sorry, part of the virus genome and detect a QN infection. So the workflow is you have a nucleic acid extraction, a nucleic acid quality control, an amplification, a cleanup, and an analysis. Of course, the PCR of RT-PCR is a reference method. But the performance of this analysis depends on multiple factors, including the stage of the infection, the experience of the person who performing the nasophagil of nasal swap, and also the quality of the PCR method used. And at the beginning of the pandemic, laboratory faced a lack of equipment and, and region, so we must improve the speed of diagnosis. Antigen screening is very important for quick identification of case, quick treatment for those people, and immediate isolation to prevent the spread. So screening is today one of the greatest challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, you see the rapid tests, they are fast, cost effective, and does not require instrumentation. It's made of mainly of immunolateral flow. The main target is the nucleocapsid, the N protein. So it's simple. You have a, a nasal of an uh, oral swab. You have an extraction uh, buffer to, to destroy the, the virus. And then you put a, a four drop on the extraction uh, solution to a cartridge, and you have a qualitative result. It's not as sensitive as PCR, so it has a higher false positive negative rate. But rapid antigen tests can contribute to, to overall COVID-19 testing capacity. You see here, you have the, the viral load. Here you see the, the limit of detection of the PCR and the limit of detection of the rapid antigen test. You can see that in the pre-infectious positive by PCR, you can have a, a false negative with the antigen test. It's the same in the post-infectious. But the, immuno, the immunoassay analyzer arrived and we see in uh, some study that we can have a better limit of detection with the new chemiluminescence analyzer. The advantage is also the throughput. Huh? It's uh, more than 200, 400 uh, tests per, per hour. You see on this study, a comparison between uh, rapid, uh, rapid antigen test and uh, a chemiluminescence solution. You see that the antigen rapid tests are very good uh, below 25 CT. It's approximately 95 uh, percentage of uh, sensitivity. 
but you see that between 25 and 30, you have a 100% with uh, the chemidine sans essay, and then you have just uh, the best test of uh, just 17%. But you also see that uh, greater than 33, you have also false negative with the chemidine sans analyzer in comparison with the PCR. So, when to use rapid antigen test for testing symptomatic population? It's not applied for the patient in, uh, in hospital, but for the other, in case of high prevalence rapid antigen tests, yes. In low prevalence, yes, if the RT-PCR capacity is limited. And better it's to do it five days after the onset of symptoms. For the screening in the asymptomatic population, yes, in case of high prevalence, and no, in case of low prevalence. And you must do it within seven days following the exposure. It's important to say that all the negative samples must be confirmed by RT-PCR because it's a, the reference method. In case of recurring screening, in high prevalence, yes, within seven days following exposure. So what are the key message? Rapid antigen tests can contribute to overall COVID-19 testing capacity. It's the advantage is the shorter turnaround time and the reduced cost especially in situation in which RT-PCR testing capacity is limited. But the test sensitivity for rapid antigen is generally lower than the, the PCR. So they perform in the best case with high of medium viral load. The recommendation is that you, you must do a, a validation before the implementation. The use of rapid antigen tests is appropriate in case of high prevalence and rapid antigen tests can help to reduce further transmission to early detection of highly infectious case. Another important part of the, is uh, assessment of the immune response. There are ser serological tests that detect antibody to show if the person has been exposed to the virus in the past, but also to, to the, for the assessment of the response to, to the vaccine. So in this case, you have immunoassay analyzer and rapid test. And we try to, to find the IgM and the IgG. So what is the role of the serological test in the screening strategy? This is a method which shows the true scale of the pandemic. A massive screening using serological tests would make it possible to find out who has been contaminated and who has not. It also, it also provides data on the number of people who have been immunized. You, sorry. You, you see that here, they it's a study from Cincinnati. They compare uh, five uh, rapid tests for antibody, IgG and IgM. But you see that uh, the targets are different. Some target the LBD, some target the RBD plus, plus S1, the other N plus S1, N plus S, but you see that the performance are very different. In this case, you see that this test uh, perform very well, but when you look at this, uh, to have a sensitivity around 8%, it's not, uh, it's not easy. So not all tests are of the same quality, so to identify an immune response against the SARS-CoV-2, it's important to, to target the right antibody. And studies show that the spike protein plays the most important role in the viral attachment and entry. 
and it serves also as a target for developing of antibody, entry inhibitor, and, uh, and vaccine. So the RBD is very important for the immunity. When you look at this, when you use molecular of antigen testing and when you use serological testing, it's clear that for diagnosis and triage of symptomatic patient, you must use the molecular and antigen testing. For the testing of, of immune response, the serological testing, and also for the monitoring of population for previous exposure. For the general population health and surveillance, uh, you can use it twice. It's the same for the employer contracted workforce testing and for screen and screening for therapy and vaccine development. So to returning to a normal situation, it's crucial for, for economic activity and mass screening and a large scale vaccination campaign should be conducted. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Ronald, uh, for the, the nice talk. Um, our next speaker is, um, um, before I announce the next speaker, um, we do not see that uh, many questions appearing and the questions and answers. If you do have questions already on one of the previous speakers, please do not hesitate to ask the question on the Q&A if you have any. Next speaker is uh, Christopher Peace, the founder of uh, Biomar. Um, Christopher Peace holds a master degree in biochemistry from the Institut National in Lyon. In his professional career, he held various technical marketing management functions in the field of industrial biomonitoring, serving pharmaceuticals, waters, and food industry. Currently, Christopher is a founder and general manager of Biomar. Uh, company dedicated to monitoring prevention of microbial contaminations in processes. Christopher, please. Yes. <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you and uh, thank you VWR, Laborama and uh, KVCV for giving me the opportunity to be with you um, today. Uh, the, if all the preventive measures um, we know undoubtedly have an effect on the spread of the disease, uh, they have not been sufficient uh, yet to control to control it. Uh, spread of contamination is uh, well known in the industry. Several of them have to deal with it on a daily basis uh, to tackle similar issues. And what we'll try and do here is to bring a, the perspective of an industry that's dealing with a, a COVID uh, pandemic uh, with the tools that they know and the, the practices they have currently. So hydro, industrial hygiene monitoring um, looks at uh, raw materials and intermediate products. It looks at air, uh, but it looks very much at um, equipment and environmental surfaces to control the cleanliness. Uh, for each of these matrices, uh, cleaning and monitoring go hand in hand. So for surfaces, the classical tiered approach is to one, do systematic visual inspection of all surfaces, then uh, frequent real-time testing. Real-time is important uh, with the ATP swabs, typically, and then do microbiological testing for uh, more quantitative and more specific information. And so in this, uh, in this presentation, we'll cover the relevance of surface testing uh, the importance of uh, time and frequency, and then uh, cover a few practical applications. Okay. So in uh, aseptic manufacturing, uh, which are the, the most um, mature, I'd say, in uh, building controlled microbial uh, conditions, uh, the they studies or the, the work is built on five pillars. One, um, the first one is the cleaning, uh, to try and answer the, the, the question, is my cleaning uh, efficient? There's no one fits all uh, solution for that because each um, material, uh, shape, design, uh, equipment, purpose, closeness to the final product, they're all different. So then, and they need to be taken into consideration. 
The second point is um, if, if uh, cleaning is mostly curative, it's also preventive. But the, uh, the question that it begs is, what else can I do to prevent contamination besides cleaning? And so the contamination control plan describes the procedures and policies designed to create a controlled uh, environment. It starts typically with a, a risk assessment, uh, including all the potential sources of contamination and followed by a prevention plan. Third is, um, is the dirty hold uh, time, which is the duration of time between an equipment sits in a soiled, so dirty state and before the cleaning. Um, the, the question is, uh, how much worse can it get uh, between the use and the cleaning? And the fourth point is uh, detecting a potential contamination um, quickly and know where to, where to find it, where to look. So that depends on the sampling plan. And the last one is, if I find something, what should I do? And actually, by the way, what is something? So these are the five, the five um, pillars, if I may say. The first one, uh, cleaning. Uh, well, despite the published longevity of uh, the virus on various surfaces, among which frequently uh, used surfaces like glass, plastic, and so on, uh, this is probably not the most challenging point uh, in the case of, um, of the COVID because the, the virus, like most enveloped uh, viruses, is pretty fragile. Actually, uh, enveloped viruses are not even used as challenge viruses for uh, virucidal products because they're so easy to destroy compared to DNA viruses. So that is, um, that is sort of the, the easy one to, to start with. Then why should we be interested in surfaces since they are not thought to be the main route of, uh, of transmission? Well, the first reason is that even if it's not the primary route of, trans of transmission, it is a route of transmission and one which is uh, easy to, to clean and monitor. So air, which is thought to be the main route of transmission is, uh, is more difficult to clean and very difficult to monitor at least for the moment. <laughs> um, and so why, why should we not uh, address something that's easy to do, um, easy to, to deal with? Then the good hygiene uh, practices are also essential to prevent the, um, the spreading of the disease. And they necessarily involve uh, monitoring to see if they're efficient. Uh, so testing surfaces is also a way of providing evidence that good uh, hygiene practices are in place. And provided that evidence is beneficial for uh, dealing with authorities, and one can think, for example, of those countries which require a test be done on the, on the surface or the packaging surface of uh, meat and other food stuff for import. And it's also useful uh, for reassuring people employees, visitors, or patients. Um, and that will be key for many business uh, restarts. And lastly, surface monitoring for SARS has shown to be um, also to give an early warning that COVID is spreading in a community or, or a building. So in places where visitors and surfaces are both closely monitored, there's been evidence that after a patient zero has um, infected a, a building, for example, the virus can be found on surfaces roughly one week before uh, there's a peak in declared COVID infection among the, the employees. So that's, um, that's also uh, a good reason uh, to, to do uh, surface surveillance. If we look at, um, in, in this model for, from, um, that comes from uh, abattoir, which is a complicated setting. Um, there's maybe another reason why uh, surfaces might be a, a relevant sampling point. Is that although they, they thought three sources of COVID transmission, which are the air, hands, and surfaces, well, they all end up uh, contaminating surfaces in the end. And surfaces, uh, as we said earlier, are easy surveillance points.
Now, th this area of um, contamination control is a bit of a stretch to apply to COVID because um, normally in a, in a controlled manufacturing um, process, uh, you can quantify those things. In the case of, uh, of the COVID spread, it's hard to predict and control the, the traffic patterns in a diversity of, um, of facilities. Uh, so contamination can occur immediately after cleaning, uh, just before cleaning, or not at all, in a bus, for example. And that will be true one day, and the next day will be all, all different. So uh, bottom line is that the traffic is most certainly among the parameters that most contributes to, um, to soiling an environment. And so it contributes very much to the risk probability. It's also a parameter that influences the risk severity since uh, when there's a, a contaminated surface in an environment, uh, the more traffic there is, uh, the, the increased chances of uh, someone being effective. There are. So uh, what, would what that would suggest is that minimizing the uh, dirty hold time means adjusting the cleaning frequency to the, to the traffic, predominantly to the traffic. Making sure a sample is representative can be difficult in all <laughs> analytical methods, uh, but it's particularly true when the matrix is not homogeneous. Um, so it's not basically not a, a perfectly mixed liquid. Uh, in a controlled manufacturing environment, the sample sites have been carefully chosen and so is the area that is uh, sampled for each test. And that once it's set will not change has little reasons of changing uh, over time because the, the manufacturing is, is um, unchanged. But in a facility receiving public, uh, things are a bit different. And the num number of uh, sampling points appears to be very, very important, much more than the um, area that is sampled. So uh, in this work by uh, Enviral Tech, which is a company based in uh, Oregon, USA, and who focuses on uh, hygiene in long-term care facilities, nursing homes, schools, and, and businesses. They showed that if, if a virus is present in a facility, the probability of detecting it is increased dramatically uh, with the number of sampling points. So from 25%, if there's only one sampling point, up to 90% chances of picking it up if there are eight sampling points. So alert in action, the um, ATP surface testing is, is really prominent in the industry, uh, despite its limits in, uh, in quantitivity and uh, sens sensitivity. Uh, it's used because it's rapid. And that gives the ability to react immediately to an undesirable contamination level before it spreads or damages the, the product. So with COVID uh, surveillance, there's a study by researchers from the University of Harvard and Colorado Boulder that shows exactly the same thing. If uh, an infected or infectious individual, sorry, is detected as positive during the first two days of his infectiousness and then uh, immediately isolated, then 65% of the spread risk is, uh, is removed. That's what we see on the left of the slide. And the model then suggests that if the interval between two tests plus the time to result, so the turnaround time, is inferior to um, one day, the infectiousness can be reduced to almost nothing, almost zero. While if that same duration interval between two tests plus time to result is 14 days, the reduction is only 25%. And that data does not, is not really impacted by the sensitivity of the test, which actually joins what Ronald just said. Um, <clears throat> so although it might be counterintuitive, uh, frequently, frequency sorry, and turnaround time are really paramount and sensitivity is less important uh, for, for, this, um, for this purpose. So, which in, in practical life means that just the faster we are aware when a surface is contaminated, faster we can clean it and contain the, the risk. 
why do people in the industry, um, why are they interested uh, in rapid surface testing? The, the, in our experience, the, the fundamental motives uh, appears to be a business restart, uh, and illustrated here by the, the um, certification by, uh, by Veritas. And that is to facilitate approval by authorities to reopen by demonstrating that the company is, uh, is really committed to security. I think that's particularly important for, for bizarre industries, uh, casinos, uh, cruise ships. I mean, by bizarre, that uh, they're not big enough to, to be of primary concern for the, for the authorities. Um, and it's also to effectively invite uh, employees and customers to come back uh, to work by reassuring the, in this time, individuals that the environment is safe. So we, we have seen a large diversity of, of business types uh, interested in, in using rapid our rapid kits. Either they use it directly because it provides them with the autonomy and economy. There's no there's no equipment. There's very little training uh, required, uh, or as a service from a third party when it's important that the, it's a third party that that um, independent from them who does the test. And we have noticed that uh, unlike in human uh, diagnostics, where false negatives are really the main concern, in environmental testing, um, there's a lot of focus also on, on false positives. And that is understandable because no one wants to close a facility uh, for cleaning uh, based on a false alert. Yes. False um, positives leads us to true positives. Uh, well, they are very unlikely on surfaces. Even in, um, in COVID patient hospital rooms who then have had COVID patients uh, before cleaning and looking at the most frequently infected surface, which is uh, the patient's smartphone, uh, no more than 8% of those um, smartphones carry detectable amounts of, uh, of virus. So even prior to cleaning, there's, um, there's not much to be, to be found. And after proper cleaning and disinfection, the probability uh, of infectious virus is, is zero. I've not, not found one publication that um, has uh, reported a virus surviving a, a disinfection. So basically the false positives, uh, or, or the, the other reason we could have positives uh, is due to cross reactivity. But uh, so, <clears throat> uh, however unlikely though, um, it is advisable to plan for a positive result so that we know uh, what the consequent actions we should be and make them manageable. Uh, obviously, you don't want to test an elevator button, uh, find that it's positive, and then uh, believe that you have to chase everybody uh, individually who has been through this elevator over the last two or three days. Um, that would not be a manageable, um, or that's an illustration of what we call a non-manageable um, action. So if the kits are used for hygiene monitoring, which is uh, most frequently the, the case, uh, a positive would simply mean uh, you have to clean again and test again. If the kits are used for surface screening, uh, a positive would suggest either that the, the point the, the sampling point is a critical control point. It should be uh, tested for and, and dealt with uh, specifically, or that the uh, control plan needs uh, improvement uh, uh, to be adjusted. And then uh, when the kits are used for screening of individuals uh, to avoid the, the um, st sticking, a, a, putting a stick up their nose, uh, a positive res uh, result would um, suggests that the individual should be uh, tested, the owner of the smartphone or um, uh, hand luggage, for example, which is another uh, screening, um, a way of screening for, for people without touching them. Uh, how the test works, well, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty simple. It's, uh, it's um, lateral flow assay with the uh, immunodetection of a virus uh, antigen. Um, it's just like a pregnancy or allergen test or drug tests. 
Uh, what we target here is the um, is a nucleocapsid uh, protein that Ronald showed on a nice picture a few minutes ago. Um, the nucleocapsid protein is wrapped around the um, the RNA, so it's internal um, to the to the test. It's uh, the most abundant of the proteins, and it's also highly highly conserved. The swabbing technique, which is used on surfaces, the uh, to recover the, the viruses from the various surfaces. Um, that is uh, the results of that is um, is quite technique dependent, but also surface dependent. The porous porous and absorbent surfaces um, are not very amenable to to swabbing. Well, hard and smooth surfaces uh, such as plastic, glass, or metal are, are, are much more uh, appropriate. Uh, in the the swabbing then depends also very much on the swabbing pattern and the pressure that is applied. So to make sure as a quality control, if you like, to verify that the, um, the swabbing technique uh, is appropriate, you can use either inactivated viruses or um, we also provide control protein, which is a recombinant protein uh, produced in insects. So, um, so in no risk of infection from virus. So the, the performances, um, the um, we said the the false the sorry the cross reactivity could be a, a cause of positives in the antigen test. The the cross reactivity is uh, same as in PCR. I mean non-existent for, for almost uh, the limits of detection for the immunodetection strip. As Runa mentioned, it's uh, it's higher than with uh, PCR. The kits can detect down to 5,000 PFU plague forming units per ml or 25.25 nanograms per ml of, uh, of the protein. Less sensitive than, um, than CT, than, uh, sorry, the PCRs. Uh, with CTs up to 30, 33, the results are quite consistent with the, with the antigen tests. Again, I'll refer to Ronald's uh, presentation, and those um, those levels of contamination are correlated or associated with the presence of infectious virus uh, on surfaces, meaning that if if uh, the the, the traces of viruses that are, are present on the surface, if they're not detected with the with the kit, it most likely means that they're not uh, infection infectious concern. The kit is uh, very easy to use, uh, even for non non experts. It's also very rugged. I mean, you can mistreat it in, in a way, as suggested on this video. So here we had um, Ashroom, our, our clear cleaning lady, in our facility, um, test our, our kits and the instructions that go with it. And of course, she didn't have uh, 15 minutes to spare. Uh, before the results. So um, she continued the, the incubation or the waiting time um, while she continued her work uh, on her trolley. And you see here that the, the tube uh, fits in the, the box cover and she could um, just continue her, her job um, while the test was ongoing. So about, about the kits, uh, they are called Covision Express. Uh, they're made in, in Europe. Uh, there's one component that's sourced in the USA, but that's all. Um, Self-contained, no equipment, rapid result. Um, they are designed for testing surfaces, uh, but you could consider testing air. Um, potentially in that case, we'd recommend using Coriolis Compact uh, with dry cones, which is basically a the cyclonic sampling for um, system for air, and the the, the the viruses get stuck on a on a dry cone, which you can come and and swab um, thereafter. Uh, it also works on on liquids, liquid samples, and all you have to do is to um, uh, put an equal amount of, of sample buffer uh, 
add that to the, um, the sample that, that, that's been picked. It is not an IVD test. Uh, it's an environmental test. So there's no kind of certification uh, required for that. I just wanted, did want to mention that uh, the, the sample buffer is uh, destructive to the virus since we are trying to detect a protein that's inside the virus. So it's destructive to the virus and most probably destructive to the virus RNA. So samples uh, are not appropriate to, once they've been treated with the our test, uh, they're not um, adequate for further PCR testing thereafter. So for, for, more, for more information, please don't hesitate to contact myself or your VWR representative or visit our, our store, which is called Pinkerton with a Q before the K. And thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you, Christopher. Um, the next uh, and, and last speaker for this evening uh, on uh, his analytical technique is uh, nobody else than Daniel uh, Sommer. He's principal scientist of Wyatt Technology. And uh, Dr. Sommer obtained his uh, uh, degree from the Israeli Institute of Technology and a PhD from the Brown University uh, both in physics and completed a postdoc in uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory and in the Weizmann Institute of Science. Prior to joining Wyatt, uh, he was working on R&D of semiconductor wafer inspection, tool, inspection tools and defense electro-optics. So please, uh, Daniel, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity to speak. And uh, thanks to all the attendees for sticking it out and uh, making it towards the end of uh, the webinars. Um, I'll be changing gears a little bit compared to the talks we heard about earlier. Um, and so we know that the, the actual, the path to exiting the pandemic is vaccines. I live in Israel and we have essentially beat the pandemic here thanks to rapid deployment and acceptance of vaccines. Uh, past few days, we've had uh, just a few dozen uh, new infections per day and between zero and five new deaths per day. And so we're pretty much done, even though the country is completely open. And so what I'll do now is uh, discuss with you the technology and the methods that are provided by my company, Wyatt Technology. And these are essential in the development and production of all types of vaccines uh, from the more traditional attenuated viruses, the proteins and polysaccharides to the latest engineered viruses and the lipid nanoparticles. Our instruments are based on different forms of light scattering and supporting technologies, but they're all intended to address the fundamental questions in R&D, which are, did you make what you intended? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Is it well-behaved and is it a robust product? And in this talk, I'll introduce the various technologies and instrumentation, and then present several case studies that demonstrate their use in biophysical characterization of different vaccine types. Uh, due to the time constraints, I certainly cannot cover all the ways that light scattering contributes to vaccine development and production. So if you're interested, I invite you to contact me or Wyatt's local representatives to learn more. So we'll start with multi-angle light scattering and that's a form of static light scattering. And here a laser beam illuminates the volume of liquid which contains the analyte and a portion of the beam is scattered by the analyte. And we have detectors that are positioned at multiple angles relative to the beam. And we use those signals to learn about the analyte, which might be a macromolecule, a virus, or a nanoparticle uh, that caused the scattering. The scattered intensity uh, can be interpreted in different ways, depending on the type of analyte. And for macromolecules, we use this equation, which relates the scattering intensity to the molar mass and the concentration of the analyte in solution. And these other terms in the equation are the NDC, which is related to refractive indices of the analyte and solvent, and the angular function P of theta. And P of theta has a property that at angle zero, uh, it equals one. And so what we do is we extrapolate the angular dependence to angle zero. Uh, and then um, uh, with the knowledge of the NDC and measurement of the concentration, we can directly obtain the molar mass. On the other hand, if the analyte is a particle, we recast the same equation as shown here. And now the scattering was related to the particle concentration N, that's the number of particles per milliliter, 
uh, the refractive indices, again, of the particle and solvent, uh, the volume of the particle, and that same P of theta. And so now by extrapolating the angle, the signal's to angle zero, and with knowledge of, knowledge of the particle size and refractive indices, we can get the particle concentration. Uh, the form of the angular scattering function is related to the size and shape of the analyte. And so we can use that information to characterize analytes with radius larger than about 10 nanometers. So for macromolecules, uh, MALS determines the RMS radius or radius of gyration. And for particles, MALS determines a dimension such as the radius of a sphere. And then if we look back at this equation here for the particles, uh, that dimension is used to determine the volume V uh, and that feeds back into the, this equation. Uh, in some cases, the volume of a particle might be determined by a parallel light scattering measurement, which is dynamic light scattering, and that can be uh, incorporated together with multi-angle light scattering. So MALS is most often used in conjunction with some kind of separation technique, such as size exclusion chromatography or field flow fractionation. And then each eluding fraction is measured with downstream detectors that typically include MALS, a UV, a differential refractometer, and possibly dynamic light scattering, or even a differential viscometer. And all these signals are combined and analyzed to yield detailed analytical characterization of the vaccine or other analyte. MALS can also be used without fractionation, and then it provides the average molar mass and size of the analyte, as well as particle concentration. So unfractionated MALS uh, is used in real-time process monitoring because it's a very rapid measurement. Uh, and it's, when it's applied in conjunction with a series, say, of different concentrations or compositions, it's used to analyze interactions in a label-free and a mobilization-free fashion. So here's an example of what you might see in SecMALS, uh, which combines size exclusion chromatography with MALS, DRI, and UV detection to characterize, in this case, a polysaccharide-based bacterial vaccine. And you'll notice here in the, in the chromatogram that the signals don't overlap perfectly. And that's uh, what we expect because that's a result of the different properties of the fractions that elude at different times. So if we select, say, a single slice here from the chromatogram, we can plot the light scattering data uh, from all the different angles to get what's known as the Debye plot. And the slope of this plot is related to the molecular size, and the y-intercept is related to the molar mass. So by analyzing each and every slice in the chromatogram, we get a detailed distribution of molar mass and size. So now that you have an idea of how SecMALS works, I just want to sketch for you a typical instrument setup. Uh, on the left, we have the separation part. Uh, that includes a standard HPLC pump, auto sampler, and size exclusion column here. And then the, de the detection part includes the HPLC's UV detector, and then the detectors from Wyatt, which are the Don MALS detect instrument, and also the OptiLab differential refractometer. And you can also embed within the MALS, uh, within the Don, a Wyatt Quell's DLS module, which provides additional size determination. And I'll go into more detail about DLS shortly. So the entire setup is orchestrated by Astra software and it controls the instruments, uh, collects and analyzes the, the data uh, in order to provide the final results. And Astra is a really powerful and, and contains many specialized analyses in addition to molar mass, size and concentration. Uh, vaccines may consist of discrete species, such as proteins or viruses, uh, each of each species being quite homogeneous, or they may be quite polydispersed, such as polysaccharides or protein polysaccharide conjugates. So here's an example of a SecMALS analysis of a sample that contains a few well-separated discrete species. Uh, we know that each peak is homogeneous because light scattering tells us that the molar mass or the size determined that each point in the peak is the same. So here, here, and here. And in this way, we can identify the monomer and the oligomers and even fragments or other impurities. Uh, this is an example of a broadly polydispersed sample where the molar mass range smoothly covers more than an order of magnitude. Uh, in these cases, the results are analyzed to provide molar mass distributions, as well as average values and the degree of polydispersity. A separation by SEC is suitable for analytes with sizes up to about 50 or 100 nanometers, depending on the columns that you use. Uh, when SEC is not appropriate, a different separation technique can be applied. And MALS is used with ion exchange chromatography, a hydrophobic interaction chromatography, 
and also advanced techniques such as field flow fractionation, which we'll hear about uh, a little bit later on. The other type of light scattering that I want to introduce is dynamic light scattering. And DOS measures very fast fluctuations in the scattering intensity at a single angle, which arise from the Brownian motion of the molecules or the particles. So while these intensity fluctuations look like noise, actually they contain some very useful information. And that's because the rate of fluctuation is related to the analyte's diffusion coefficient, which is related in turn to particle size. The larger the particle, the more slowly it diffuses, and therefore the rate of fluctuations will be slower. So there's a mathematical transformation called autocorrelation analysis. It's applied to these fluctuations, produces this autocorrelation uh, function plotted here on the left. And the time scale where the plot drops off, uh, that indicates the diffusion coefficient. And then this information is further transformed to produce the plot on the right, which is the hydrodynamic size distribution. So DLS determines hydrodynamic size and it can measure sizes well below one nanometer. And that means it complements MALS very nicely since MALS only measures radii from 10 nanometers and up. A DLS can be used online to measure the size of eluding fractions. And it can also be used without fractionation, which we call batch DLS. A batch DLS works in microcovettes, so in Wyatt's Dynapro Manostar, or in micro well plates uh, in the Dynapro plate feeder. Uh, whereas MALS can only provide average sizes for unfractionated samples, batch DLS can determine a complete size distribution. Uh, on the one hand, the resolution is low compared to what you get if you separate. But on the other hand, uh, it does cover a very large size range and it takes much less time than SEC MALS or, or FFF MALS, and therefore it's a great tool for screening. So now that we've had a chance to review how light scattering works, let's put it to use. Uh, for, in this case, for characterizing vaccines. And the first question I think when coming up with a vaccine candidate is, does it do what it's supposed to do? So let's see some examples of uh, properties that can be probed with light scattering. Uh, the first case study will look at, ant at an antigen characterized by SecMALS. Uh, so combining SecMALS with UV and refractive index detection enables us to determine not only the, the total molar mass of the antigen, but that of its constituents. Uh, in this case, the proteinaceous part and the glycans or perhaps some other conjugated moiety such as a nucleic acid or a polysaccharide. Uh, here we see MALS UV uh, RI analysis of two spike proteins, one from MERS and one from SARS-1 coronaviruses. And in both chromatograms, the UV trace is shown overlaid with three measured molar masses. And since we know the pure proteins molar masses, we can immediately infer that both of these exist as trimers uh, with a molar mass of the trimer being around 450 kilodaltons, three times the molar mass of the monomer of the protein. And in addition, each spike protein is heavily glycosylated. So we get the molar mass of the glycans, which is about 20% by weight of the entire uh, molecule. So as you can see, SecMALS provides direct measurement of the amount and size of the aggregates and of fragments. Uh, by measuring the molar mass directly, you'd be able to tell immediately, for instance, if this tail over here in the chromatogram, uh, or perhaps a secondary peak is a fragment or maybe a host cell protein, or perhaps it's just tailing due to column interactions. And then SecMALS analysis enables you to conclusively assess the yield and the quality of say a particular expression system or a mutant. High throughput DLS in micro well plates is really invaluable if you need to screen dozens or hundreds of expression systems or stabilizing mutations or different purification preps to identify the best one. Now here we see data provided by the Vaccine Institute and Texas Children's Hospital at Baylor College of Medicine. And using the Dynapro plate reader, they're able to screen 96 different formulations uh, completely automatically to find the optimal conditions for their molecule. Uh, within an hour, they could visualize which formulations maintain the desired confirmation uh, shown here in red or perhaps cause the moderate level of aggregation shown here in blue, or cause the entire sample to aggregate shown in black. Uh, the plate reader is compatible with 96, 384, and 1536 well plates, and it accommodates a wide range of samples and conditions. And then once you've done this initial screening, the best uh, ones can then be further analyzed for yield, structure, and function. SecMALS is also helpful in probing interactions of an antigen with 
host receptor or neutralizing antibodies. And so here we have SecMol's data that were published by the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, the viral gly glycoprotein by itself, shown here in blue, eludes primarily as a monomer with the expected molar mass. You can see it's quite uniform across the peak. And there's a small fraction here of oligomer. But when the glycoprotein is incubated with an antigen binding fragment, you can see now in green three distinct populations. First is uh, this peak here, which has three fab domains bound to the glycoprotein trimer. The fact that this peak is so much larger compared to the pure glycoprotein oligomer indi indicates that the interaction with the fab stabilizes the trimer. Uh, the second peak is a single fab bound to a glycoprotein monomer. And all this is based on the molar mass uh, that we measure. Uh, and also since there was excess fab in the solution, we see a final peak of unbound fab. And you'll notice that the molar mass of each peak indicates exactly what the stoichiometry is for each species. Uh, since the interaction here was quite strong, the binding is not uh, destroyed by the dilution that occurs on the SEC column. Uh, it's interesting also to note that the glycoprotein monomer and the unbound fab have about the same molar mass, but they elude at two very different times in this SCC chromatogram. And that's a result of the different conformations of the molecules uh, related to the presence of the glycans on the glycoprotein. Uh, if you're only to look at the elution time, you'd actually come up with a very wrong conclusion about the oligomeric state of the glycoprotein. Now let's review some examples of determining if the vaccine substance pr produced is the intended product, uh, which could, could be a virus, a virus-like particle, a gene delivery vehicle, or a bacterial polysaccharide. And this kind of characterization helps ensure a robust product through upstream and downstream processing, as, as well as final quality control. I've already mentioned field fill fractionation a couple of times, and now it's time to take a closer look. FFF is a separation technique that combines with MALs and other detection modalities, just like SEC, uh, but in this case, it provides detailed characterization of viruses, lipid nanoparticles, and other vaccine types that might not be amenable to fractionation by SEC. Uh, as you can see in the photo here, an FFF mall system is not so different from a sec mall system, except that the size exclusion column has been replaced by this FFF channel. And there's an additional instrument, uh, why it's Eclipse FFF controller, which is at the bottom of the instrument stack on the right. So FFF affords several benefits, uh, one of them being the fact that unlike SEC, it works with an open channel. And that means that there's no shear on the analyte and very little opportunity for surface interactions, uh, unlike chromatography. So let's take a look at how the separation works. Inside the eclipse channel, there's a, a microfluidic flow gradient that accomplishes all the separation. Uh, the base of the channel consists of a semi-permeable membrane and then the rest of the channel is just open fluid. Uh, when flow is applied, some of the liquid flows parallel to the membrane, and that's called channel flow. And some, called cross flow, goes through the membrane. The cross flow push, pushes the analyte towards the membrane, but the fusion causes it to move up and away from the membrane. And the balance between these forces results in a different distribution relative to the membrane for different sizes. The larger particles diffuse less, and they stay closer to the membrane while the smaller particles diffuse more and uh, they go farther up. And so while the, the, now that the channel flow is laminar, and that means that the fluid closer to the membrane uh, is, uh, flows more slowly, while the fluid that's higher up from the membrane uh, uh, flows more quickly. And the end result is that the small particles are swept out more quickly and the larger particles are swept out more slowly. The separation power, the elution time, and the resolution are all controlled by changing the flow rates and the ratio of the cross flow to channel flow. And that makes this separation very versatile. FFF malls can be applied to a wide range of particles that are inaccessible to chromatography, lipid nanoparticles, mRNA, uh, large viruses with sizes up to one micron and beyond can be separated and quantified uh, by FFF malls. All the same analyses that we mentioned before are also available, including true measure of the identity, the size, polydispersity, and confirmation of the of vaccine products. And these, these properties are important because they can impact pharmacokinetics and they're important for monitoring and controlling 
uh, throughout the life cycles of a product development and production. So let's look at two case studies where FFF MALS was applied to the quantification of flu virus, uh, influenza virus uh, vaccine particles. In the first study, scientists at MedImmune used FFF MALS to quantify virus monomer and aggregates. So the solid black line here shows the light scattering intensity where we see the primary monomer peak, and then here there's a small dimer peak. Uh, overlaid in blue is the radius measured by MALS. You can see it's 45 nanometers uh, across the monomer peak in perfect agreement with the radius measured by uh, transmission electron microscopy. And then the second overlay in red is the particle concentration at each point, and it's also measured by MALS. And the total concentration integrated across the peak was within about 5% of the particles determined by TEM. Uh, FFF MALS requires no sample preparation and it's automated like chromatography. And that makes for much easier routine monitoring compared to TEM or some other methods. Uh, more recently, scientists at the CDC in the US investigated sensitivity and linearity of influenza virus, uh, the concentration measurements using FFF MALS. And here we see injection quantities spanning about two orders of magnitude where MALS quantified the total number of influenza virus particles with excellence, linearity, and sensitivity as shown in this graph. And they found that MALS accurately determined the number of virions with injections as low as 2.3 million virions. Uh, compared to other techniques, including PCR, FFF MALS was far faster for quantitation with results in less than one hour and significantly less sample preparation, which can be labor intensive and error prone. Uh, more recently, we focused on the analysis of lipid nanoformulations for delivering mRNA, uh, which of course uh, is the basis for some COVID vaccines as well as novel gene therapies. And FFF models, as usual, provides detailed size distributions, accurate particle concentrations, and robust fully automated measurements. In addition, we've uh, recently developed a new algorithm, which as we can see here, uh, determines the RNA payload as a function of the particle size. Uh, some upcoming publications that are currently in preparation will provide more details in comparison with conventional payload analyses, which tend to be more cumbersome and labor intensive, but on the other hand are less accurate. So time is short and I'll wrap up now with some examples that demonstrate how light scattering is applied in formulation development and to evaluate stability. Uh, DLS measurements that we have seen provide rapid feedback on size distributions. And in fact, they also determine particle concentration in a similar manner as MALS, though without separation, uh, the accuracy tends to be lower. Uh, by loading up a plate with samples from a series of formulations of process variants or fractions from a purification step, the DynePro plate reader can quickly evaluate their purity and tighter. But there's more since it's great for assessing stability as well. But one type of stability assessment is thermal stability, which is closely tied to uh, the conformational stability of the product. And the other is colloidal stability, which is linked to the behavior of the biomacromolecules in their native folded state. So typically there are two approaches to thermal stability. In the first, we ramp the temperature and monitor the behavior to see at which temperature the sample, sample begins unfolding or aggregating. Uh, multiple formulations can be tested at once in a single plate. And here we see that the formulation had actually no effect on the aggregation temperature of a virus. Uh, the second approach is to hold the sample at an elevated temperature, uh, often 40 degrees centigrade, and monitor the degree of aggregation through the size uh, over time. So in this example from a virus-like particle, uh, there's a significant distinction in aggregation rate between the variants, and that the, this uh, difference is indicative, indicative of differences in long-term stability. Uh, colloidal stability is actually determined by measuring the diffusion coefficient as a function of concentration. And the result is KD that we see here. Uh, it's called the diffusion interaction parameter. And it indicates the propensity of these VLPs to self-associate. So the positive KD value of VLP1 uh, suggests good colloidal stability, while the large negative value of VLP2 is a significant indicator of poor colloidal stability. And that often leads to short shelf life of the product. Batch DLS is typical go-to technique for quickly assessing particle size. And in this example of a lipid nanoparticle, 
Uh, three different LNP preps are seen to have very similar DLS autocorrelation functions. Uh, that suggests very similar average sizes. Uh, at the same time, we get reliable measurements of particle concentration. And that's really useful when the process is under control, but DLS may not give sufficient detail when you're developing a new production process or formulation. And so in cases where you need a more detailed fingerprint, uh, FFF models is really the, the correct uh, technique to use. It provides high resolution, in-depth characterization of the lipid nanoparticles, just if, as we saw previously for viruses. Uh, here we see FFF fractograms for the exact same lipid nanoparticles represented here in the DLS data. So while the DLS autocorrelation functions look almost identical, the fractograms tell a very different story, showing three completely different size distributions. And for all three of these samples, uh, MALS provides quantitation of the particle size, particle concentration, and aggregate content. And when combined with UV and RI detection, it also quantifies encapsulated uh, mRNA. So after reviewing uh, Wyatt's light scattering toolbox and our solutions for vaccine discovery, development, and production, uh, there are many, many examples that I have not had time to include. Uh, and those uh, cover process monitoring, adjuvant characterization, um, analysis of uh, biomolecular interactions as well. Uh, these tools can be applied to antigen proteins and polysaccharides, RNA or DNA used for gene delivery, lipid nanoparticles, virus-like particles, and even complete viruses. And in particular, MALS combined with SEC or FFF does provide in-depth characterization of molar mass, size, identity, aggregate content, and yield, whereas DLS is ideal for rapid and robust screening of size, stability and concentration to optimize product quality. And both models and DLS methods can be transferred to the production line for monitoring and lot release of vaccine products. So all these techniques are complementary and they can be used together as well as with other orthogonal techniques uh, to give you really comprehensive characterization of vaccine products. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, I invite you to visit wyatt.com slash vaccines or to email me, vsummitwyatt.com, or email us at infoatwide.com to have a local representative uh, get in touch. And I thank you all for your attention and be happy to answer questions during the DNA period. All right. Thanks, Daniel, uh, for, the, for the talk. Um, I would like to go once uh, very shortly to, um, to the question and answer uh, session. Um, there weren't that many uh, in it, Thomas, please correct me. Um, there was one on the, on the first speaker for Pete Maas. This is, uh, the question is, are the data of the non-spike mutations actually already usable to determine uh, antiviral medicines uh, towards? Uh, have you any, anything done already on that or, or any clue if that is already possible with the, what you already uh, uh, sequenced? So it's definitely possible. So we ourselves, we are not doing that. So we are not uh, modeling specialists, but there are several groups, uh, a few in Belgium, but also international that are actually working on that, that they are modeling, uh, for example, the polymerase to see what possible targets could be used uh, to target them uh, with antiviral compounds. So it's actually, it's possible and they're working on it, yes. Okay, good. And then there was a, a, a question for uh, Peter Permans. Um, I think Peter you already answered the question. Um, so the question was actually uh, on the, depends on, on the, of your chips actually towards different variants. Um, then you already replied, but you can reply for the whole public perhaps shortly. Yeah, the, the question was whether the detection method we use on chip uh, is variant specific. Um, so, so, so not really. Yet. So, it's an it's an RT qPCR assay. Um, <clears throat> by choosing your your primers correctly, you can uh, you can make sure that either it reports all variants, uh, or if you choose to, you can also make the assay variant specific. That's really a choice you have today. In our clinical uh, testing, we actually use an, an we use a region of the genome that is not under evolutionary pressure, the N gene, so we can guarantee that uh, <clears throat> that we're seeing all variants. When we the comparative tests we're doing, uh, so the other uh, sample types, there we uh, 
there we've seen the the same evolution that that Pete has shown the uh, the where the uh, the UK variant has really taken over. So, but but in in short, the answer is that you know the the detection technology doesn't it's not very independent. It's 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 really you 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 pick the PCR assay you want to use on the platform. Okay, and I, I had um, one last question for Daniel uh, Daniel Som. Um, the the vaccine from um, from Pfizer is. Uh, are they using quality control with with uh, with with the setup of uh, of triple F mouse, or uh, are they doing a, a SEC DLS, or do you know something on that? How would you do it if you would be Pfizer? Right. So I'm not at liberty to say what Pfizer does. Um, at, at this point in time, FFF mouse is not typically used in quality control. It's used in in, in uh, development. Uh, process development and product development. However, dynamic light scattering is a kind of quick and pretty uh, simple type of measurement that is suitable for quality control. And it is often used in quality control of nanoparticle type products. All right, good. Currently, we don't see any further questions. So um, therefore, um, I would like to thank uh, all five speakers for this evening. Um, they uh, elaborated on us uh, how, how they are challenging and using their analytical expertise to, to tackle all the challenges in COVID times. So I would like to thank you all five um, in name of um, uh, Laborama and in name of KVCV for this interesting meeting uh, and, uh, and webinar. Uh, Piet Maas, uh, Peter Poemans, Ronald Bailly, Christopher Peace, and uh, Daniel Sommer. All right, thanks a lot. And uh, you also for uh, listening to us till now, I think more than 300 people. So uh, I hope you had some interesting new insights, new questions, uh, discussions, please. Uh, okay, thanks also for, uh, for having joined uh, this, uh, this evening. Okay, bye. <laughs>